Well, thank you, Tim, very much for your kind introduction. And I'm not sure I can uh, quite beat the, the boiler room story, which I found interesting and extremely apt. Uh, but I am extremely pleased to be here this morning to, uh, to speak to you. With the spending review, it is certainly an important day for the coalition today. And I would like to start by setting out the macroeconomic picture and the background to where we are. I will then talk about some of the challenges faced by businesses and what the government is doing to help. The UK economy is recovering, as you will know, from the biggest financial crisis in generations. We continue to have to face the consequences and the Chancellor commented at the weekend, and I quote, I'm confident we are coming out of intensive care and we can turn this country around. There's certainly a chance of a relapse if we abandon our plan. And so the results of the latest spending review to be announced by the Chancellor later today are a reminder of the challenges that the government faces. This spending review will set the stage for government spending for the 2015 to 16 financial year. Now, most media focus will be on this today. Nevertheless, some of the more esteemed media attention is closer to home. And I'm pleased to see that uh, Kamal Ahmed of the Sunday Telegraph is chairing the panel discussion after me. Alongside our strategy for deficit reduction, we are determined to ensure that the business climate is as favorable as possible. And this is the key to the recovery. Our consistent ambition has been to make the UK the best place in Europe to start and grow a business. We are also beginning to see the benefit of successful businesses like yours, or ones that you advise in the economy. And firstly, the employment rate recently reached its highest level since records began, that is 1971, 29.76 million and a 24,000 increase since the last quarter. Secondly, the level of company liquidations in the first quarter of 2013 was at its lowest level since 2008. And thirdly, the UK remained Europe's top recipient of foreign direct investment projects in 2012. Indeed, according to Ernst & Young, the UK saw a rise in the number of projects coming to the UK, despite the first decline in total investments across Europe since 2008. And the UK government remains determined to back business in the UK. For example, just over a week ago, we saw the Prime Minister launching a new information economy strategy. And this has brought together industry and government to develop a new approach to industrial strategy for this sector. We have also seen new government projects deliver real benefits to UK businesses. For example, in its first five months, the Green Investment Bank has mobilised £2.3 billion of investment in green projects, including £635 million of its own capital invested in 11 schemes. So what are the challenges and what are we doing to help? One challenge is government itself, including how it produces a framework for regulation and its procurement practices and we have taken significant steps on both counts. We have introduced a one-in, two-out rule for domestic legislation, and this means that the cost to business of new regulations needs to be offset by deregulation that delivers at least double the cost savings to business. We also introduced in April 2011 a three-year moratorium on new domestic regulation, affecting micro-businesses and startups. And earlier this month, we announced that the moratorium will now be extended to firms with up to 50 staff and will continue from 2014. Now, this has directly benefited SMEs. And to take one example, SMEs have saved £390 million by government not extending the right to request time to train to businesses with fewer than 250 employees. Our aspiration is also to deliver 25% of all central government procurement through SMEs. To help achieve this, we have opened up central government procurement through a number of useful new tools designed to help SMEs navigate the government system. We have also significantly simplified the procurement process for SMEs. A further challenge is to help SMEs to access the support that they need to start and grow. For example, we have set up the Growth Accelerator Scheme 
a £200 million premium advice service to help up to 26,000 SMEs to grow. We have also established the Manufacturing Advisory Service, and this focuses on helping SME industries in England to develop advanced manufacturing capabilities. And we have established a £30 million growth vouchers programme, and this will test different ways to encourage firms to seek external advice and the impact of that advice on the ground. But it is our third challenge, it is the third challenge faced by growing companies that will most interest you here today. And this is the challenge of access to finance, which I'm sure will be very familiar to you. Now, we all know that it has been much harder for some businesses to access appropriate forms of finance since the crisis of 2008. One of the lessons from this difficult period has been that the economy has been too reliant on only one source of finance, and that, you will know, is, is debt finance. About 85% of the SME current account market sits with the big four banks, RBS, Lloyds, Barclays, and HSBC. Compare this to only a few percent of SMEs that currently use equity finance. So what are we doing to address this? To start with, we are working with the market to increase the diversity of finance available to businesses. And Vince Cable announced the creation of the government-backed business bank last September with one billion pounds worth of new public funding. We have already launched its first phase, a 300 million pound investment program. Through this, the government will invest alongside private investors over the next two years to provide diverse sources of funding for SMEs. The first investments are expected by the end of this year and the bank will become fully operational once EU state clearance has been obtained. Now, we ran a smaller exercise last year targeting innovative lenders. After running a competitive process, we decided to invest through a number of different quality platforms, including peer-to-business lenders, such as Funding Circle or Zopa, invoice financing, such as Eureka, and Market Invoice, just to name a few. So a diversified approach to complement the traditional established forms of finance. But many of you will know the limitations of debt financing. Equity financing is often needed to create the most long-term value. And this is why we have increased our commitment to venture capital investment and to filling the, for, 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 to filling the equity gap for early stage innovative SMEs through the Enterprise Capital Fund program. Since May 2010, nearly 80 companies have received new investments totaling 110 million pounds. We have also expanded the Business Angel Co-Investment Fund, which aims to support angel investments into high-growth potential early-stage SMEs. And we are increasing equity investment in SMEs through tax incentives, launching the Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme, SEIS, and expanding the EIS, which will be familiar to you. Which leads me now onto the importance of the public market and the listed companies. Now, to me as Biz Minister, every UK company listed on the public markets is important, providing jobs and growth prospects for the UK economy. But without a functioning public equity market at the top of the funding ladder, equity investment further down is skewed and reduced. The role of the public equity markets extends deep into the rest of the economy. It is not limited to just those companies listed on the markets. We ourselves have recently seen this influence very clearly when working with key sectors of the economy to prepare industrial strategies. I also see it here in the diversity of companies attending today, ranging from professional services and advanced materials to those specializing in life sciences. And this is why this government has taken a number of significant measures to improve companies' access to funding from the public equity markets. And these measures include, firstly, working with the London Stock Exchange to develop its new high growth segment. Secondly, consulting on including shares from growth markets in ISAs. And thirdly, the announcement in the March budget to remove stamp duty from the trading of shares on growth markets. And I do hope that this demonstrates that the UK government values greatly the listed company sector. We need to keep looking at whether the public markets work as best as they can for smaller quoted companies, and we will continue to do so. And if I could put a challenge to you today for discussion, it would be to think about the contribution 
of the public markets to the UK economy and what else could be done to improve it further. Now, I would like to touch briefly on corporate governance. And I know that many of you today here are from the professional advisory community. The issues of corporate governance will be your bread and butter. I have discussed how public markets increase a company's capacity to grow by increasing access to finance. But listing also brings with it a different way of operating with the challenge of greater accountability to public shareholders. Companies need to demonstrate good corporate governance if they want to access finance through the public markets. And this gives comfort to outside investments about their shareholder rights. But the benefits of robust corporate governance extend well beyond the protection of basic shareholder rights. Good government, governance characterized by effective communication with shareholders, a strong board, and a clear articulation of strategy supports the achievement of long-term shareholder value and growth. These benefits have been recognized by smaller quoted companies who are choosing to apply rigorous governance practices. So I welcome the Quoted Companies Alliance leadership in this area, encouraging good corporate governance practices in smaller quoted companies. Your recently published governance code for small and mid-sized quoted companies provides a strong framework. It provides flexible guidelines which companies can adopt in a way which works for them and brings real benefits both to them and their investments. And finally, I do wish you well at your conference today. I'm sure that you will be focusing on all of these issues in much more detail. And I would like to thank you lastly for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you very much. Uh, Lord, Lord Younger, if I may, um, two key issues for our members and indeed for all quoted companies um, are the forthcoming changes um, in October to narrative reporting and also to the disclosures on directors' remuneration. Um, how do you see companies changing their behaviour in the light of these changes to narrative reporting and uh, directors' remuneration? Well, uh, the reforms, as you probably know, are designed to simplify and strengthen uh, companies' non-financial reports. And uh, these were laid before Parliament um, earlier this month by my colleague in Viz, uh, Joe Swinson. Um, and I think one of the reasons for this is that reports had become rather bogged down in uh, corporate jargon. Uh, they were confusing and they lacked clarity. And to be honest, they detracted from the effectiveness and, and indeed their purpose. So again, as you may know, from the 1st of October, annual reports will now include a uh, strategic report, as it's defined, replacing the business review. So there will be, in my view, an easier to read story, including uh, a focus on the business model, uh, a focus on the risks and the challenges for, for each businesses. Um, and with that uh, will come, should come, greater openness and clarity on some of the issues. And as you will know, there are certain things that have to be reported on, including the uh, improved, um, uh, well, breakdown of men and women on boards is one of the things, which is a recommendation uh, that came through uh, Lord Davis of Abbasock's uh, report. Uh, new disclosures on greenhouse gas emissions and information on uh, human rights issues. And I th think this is all very good stuff. So you will probably know all that. In terms of the actual question as to how that will change behavior, I think there are two aspects to that. One is that I think there will definitely be improved communication on other things that matter with shareholders, not just things that have mattered for so many decades in the past. And I think there'll be greater focus and precision on the long-term decisions and direction, and particularly the ethos and the management of, of each company. And I think secondly, uh, shareholders and companies will inevitably, and it's a very good thing, of course, to work, uh, they will work more closely together. They will work better on issues relating to executive remuneration with greater transparency and accountability. And I think the big change is that there'll be a closer link between executive remuneration and performance, which I think is long overdue and has caused such a furore everywhere amongst businesses, but particularly in the press. And shareholders will be better informed. And I think 
ultimately they will be able to, or should be able to, change things more easily as a, as a result of this. So rather a long answer, but I hope that that, uh, that helps. And how will you measure the effect of these changes and over what time period? Well, if I could focus on the timing first, um, we are going to actually formally review this policy in 2017, so some way away, but I think we do need a bit of time to, uh, to see these changes through and to be able to have a, a period of time during which we can, we can measure the effective, effectiveness or otherwise. Um, it's also in line with our pledge to have more uh, post-legislative scrutiny of regulations, and I think that's a very good thing. Um, in terms of the actual monitoring and the measuring, it will be through shareholder discussions, um, as you might expect, investor satisfaction surveys and, and questionnaires, in order to be able to effectively measure and monitor and compare data uh, on a year-to-year -year basis. I mean, in terms of uh, how that's put together, that, that will be, have to be done in such a way that the, uh, the information is, is fulsome and it's um, uh, accurate and it is measurable year on year. And uh, that's not for me to say, but that's, that would be the objective behind it. Please could you all join me in thanking Lord Younger. Thank you.